It is good to be with all of you this morning. What a treat it is to have the, our trombone choir. Thank you again for being here today. <laughs> I love the variety in worship that we have here. You never quite know what you're going to get when you come on a Sunday morning, but it is all glorifying to the Lord. Well, today we are beginning a new series on the book of Exodus, and uh, we're covering the first couple of chapters today. So I've asked Brant Toulouse to help me by reading the first part. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, today's scripture readings are going to be in the book of Exodus. And the book of Exodus has deeper meaning for me in my life right now as I've watched the exodus of sleep in my life with a newborn. So um, this is from Exodus chapter 1, verses 6 to 17. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithon and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread with the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that a baby is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. Brand. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible, by the way, uh, we will be hanging out a lot in Exodus 1, 1 and 2. So you can find that as the second book in at the beginning of the Bible. So this is another section from Exodus chapter 2. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female servants to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. And finally, Exodus 2, starting with verse 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Holy God, we thank you that you hear our groanings and our cries. You are not a God who is far off. You are God who is here. You are God who sent your son because of our cries and groanings that we are broken people who needed to be redeemed. And Lord, we pray that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit on us today, that you would awaken our hearts and minds and souls to the, these words of truth from your, from your scriptures. Lord, may we not only be hearers of the word, but doers also. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Well, it may feel a little bit weird to go from Easter Sunday to back to the beginning of the Old Testament, to, to go to Exodus. But God's plan of redemption, of redemption through Jesus Christ started at the very, very beginning. You may remember in Genesis, we just covered that a few weeks ago. Genesis at the beginning, uh, there was a, when Adam and Eve fell, God promised that the offspring of Eve would crush the serpent's head. God promised and began the work of redemption from the beginning. And this step in Exodus, God is working a plan of redemption for his people already. One author that I love, Christopher Wright, he said, It is the Exodus that provided the primary model of God's idea of redemption. So we're going to see enacted God's plan for redemption, even when it feels like everything is lost and despairing. God's got a plan the whole time. It is easy for us in our lives to feel like everything is going wrong, we are lost, we are not sure how to handle uh, the very broken world around us. But as we look at these stories today, we will see that God has a plan. He hears, he sees, he knows what's going on, and he will intervene, and he will bring redemption no matter how bad our situation may, may look like. So if you remember, at the end of Genesis, we have had, uh, we had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then <clears throat> Jacob's son, Joseph, uh, his brothers hated him and sold him into slavery. So J Joseph comes down to Egypt. He is thrown in, he, he's, he rises to a, a level of respect in Potiphar's house, but because of a false accusation, he ends up in prison. After that, he is uh, redeemed from prison, brought and put in a place of power because he's able to interpret dreams. And God uses him to save his own family from famine, and he invites his father Jacob and all of his brothers to come down to Egypt and to settle there while this famine goes on. Seventy people came down with, with Jacob at that point, and, and there was this promise that God made to Jacob. I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. So there's this promise hanging over them that even though they're in Egypt, they're, they will be able to go back to the land that God has promised, and God will redeem them. Everything was going really well for a while, as long as the Pharaoh um, and, and that, that line of Pharaohs knew that these were honored people who helped save Egypt. They were the ones that, uh, that, that redeemed them from the really difficult time. It was because of Joseph that, that Egypt survived this horrible famine. But as soon as there was a regime change, there was a new Pharaoh in town who didn't care about this story about Joseph all those years ago. Suddenly, he began to see that, that the, these Hebrews were, were populating the nation. They were taking over, and everybody got afraid of them. They were the immigrants. They were the ones that were other, and they kept having babies, and we have to put a stop to that. So they first tried just simple oppression, and just putting them in slavery and, and, and uh, beating them and, and making them work in horrible conditions. There's actually a, a papyrus scroll from the time of Ramses II that mentions that the Hebrews were being used to drag the stones to the great pylon. So these, these Hebrew slaves were being used, uh, and, and again, this is a source from outside the Bible that tells us this, uh, that they were being used to build these huge cities for the pharaohs. Um, they started off at, at about 70 people, and then by the end, in, in Exodus 12, we're told that there were hundreds of thousands of Hebrews by that time. No wonder that, that Egypt, Egyptians were starting to get worried that these Hebrews would come and take over their land, or they'd, they, they'd align themselves with, uh, with, with their enemies and, and come and take over. So after the, the oppression for a while didn't work, then they decided that they would go for infanticide that they would kill the babies. The Pharaoh orders the, the Hebrew midwives to kill every single baby boy. And can you imagine that edict, of that, the horror of that? But these incredibly brave midwives, Shipra and, and Pua, Shipra's name means the beautiful one, Pua's name means the splendid one. They decided to fear God and not Pharaoh. It, it says, uh, 
the midwives feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. As, as we think about this little moment, it's just a little vignette, but it's a, it's a, a moment of great courage. These women who were told to do something by the person that could, could order them killed themselves, they decided that God was more important than following a human leader who wanted something so evil as, as to kill these infants. It's interesting that in this, all of Exodus, we never get a name of a pharaoh. We get a title, it's like king, but we don't get their name. But who gets named here? These two midwives. God, that is a huge honor for them that we know who they are. And it says that God blessed them and gave them families of their own because they honored and obeyed God. They, they talked about how vigorous the women, the Hebrew women were and, and nothing could stop them from giving birth. They'd give birth before the midwives would even get there. And so the, the nation of Israel continued to grow in, in their place. But Pharaoh became even harder than that, and he ordered the Hebrews or the Egyptians, and whenever they saw a young Hebrew boy, to kill him anyway. And so this mass infanticide is going on, and it's horrific. And that is what sets the scene then for this, this moment where Moses is born, a Levite father and a Levite mother. We want to get the idea from the very beginning of his life that these are holy people. That, that they are going to give birth to someone who will be a priest. He will also be a prophet. We see that, that lineage happening from the very beginning. And they face this, this horrible order as well. That that baby boy is supposed to be killed. What would you do? The mother um, knows that, that she has no choice but to hide him. And then she decides that what she can do is entrust him to the Lord and pray that God will take care of him by setting him in a basket on, on the Nile River. The basket she uses is a, a normal basket that was made out of the reeds from the river, but this time she puts tar and pitch on it to make sure that it's watertight. Do you remember what else was put, had tar and pitch on it? It was the Noah's Ark. So this, this is literally, they actually use the word ark for, for Moses' basket. This is an ark that is carrying something incredibly precious. I, I love how you can see the hand of God on this whole story. Moses gets put in the basket and put in the reeds, and his sister, is probably Miriam, was sent to look after him and, and to, to keep an eye on him. She's following close by, and suddenly God brings along Pharaoh's daughter. And gives Pharaoh's daughter compassion for this little Hebrew baby that was left to die. But again, the mom knows that God is going to take care of her boy. And so Miriam <clears throat> immediately asks Pharaoh's daughter, Would, do you want me to find a wet nurse for you? <coughs> Excuse me. And so she, 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 of course, brings Moses right back to his mom. Can you imagine the celebration of that? That this moment of of Moses' mom getting her baby back. I and mean, it must have been the most joyful moment <coughs> as they, they celebrated God's redeeming of Moses himself. And this, again, is a foretelling of the redemption that God is about to work. He was pulled out of the reeds, out of the river, and God is going to make a way through the reeds and through the waters with his people many years later. God is already at work. The interesting thing is, in the middle of all of this, God is not actually mentioned until that very end of chapter 2. And we, we, we know that God is there. We can see his hand kind of quietly behind the scenes, but he's not actually named until the end. But first, we see Moses grow up. He grows up in Pharaoh's household. And when he's a young man, he decides to go and look and see how his people are doing. It says that he went out, he very intentionally went to check out what was going on. He wasn't just going around for a stroll. He wanted to understand. He knew that he was different from the rest of the people in Pharaoh's household, and he wanted to understand what was going on with his own people. So he went out and he, he, he saw how they were being treated, and then he came upon uh, an Egyptian beating an is, is, uh, Israelite to death. A, the, the word there that was used, it was a violent beating, probably unto death. And Moses 
can't see, just is left undone. And so he kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. The next day he comes and he finds two Hebrews fighting each other. And they say, what, are you going to kill one of us like you did the Egyptian? And suddenly Moses knows that everybody knows what happened the day before. Pharaoh finds out and Moses has to flee to the desert. This, even this, is preparation for what Moses has to do as he has to lead his people through the desert to the promised land. God brings him to the place where Moses needs to learn. Moses spends 40 years in that desert, but God is with him. The first thing that happens to Moses, he flees in and he finally comes to a well and he sits down at the well. Do you remember in Genesis what happens when single men sit down by a well? There's going to be a wedding. <laughs> so, of course, the, the daughters of Jethro come along, and, and they're, some of the shepherds try to attack them and shoo them away, but Moses rescues, him and rescues them, and, and they bring him back to Dad, and Dad gives one of the daughters to Moses as a wife. Moses has acted honorably, and Jethro takes him in and teaches him and trains him and helps him to, to establish himself, and he has a pretty good life. But God has not forgotten about the Israelites. We see over and over and over in, the, in this last two verses. I'll, I'll read, you, read it to you from the ESV translation. So we haven't had God's name at all. And now suddenly listen for how many times God's name shows up. During, the many days the king, during those many days, the king of Egypt died. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up from God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Isn't that powerful? God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. He knew what they were going through, and he knew it was time to begin to redeem them. John Calvin had an interesting point that, that he felt like the people of Israel, if life had been great in, in Egypt, the Israelites never would have wanted to go back to the promised land. It had to get really bad for them to want to, to leave this land that was fed by a river and didn't have to rely on the rains for, for watering the crops. They, 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 it was a very wealthy country. They were doing fine. But God allowed this oppression to happen so that they would be ready to then come and go into the promised land. God knew how hard it would be, and they needed strength and fortitude to get through that. But God heard their cries, he heard their groaning, and he was already at work. Forty years earlier, he had prepared Moses and saved his life and sent him in the into the desert for training so that he would be ready when the time came to come and reach out to the people of Israel. Next week, uh, Bruce Tenenbaum is going to be preaching for us and sharing about the burning bush, that moment when Moses has this encounter with God and God gives him the commission to go back. But in this week, we're seeing how God is laying the stage for this, that he is in preparation all the way along. And we know, even as we just celebrated Easter last week, we see that, th that this is also laying the, the, the groundwork for the story of Jesus' redemption. That Jesus is the one who was set apart, who was, who was, was saved from, from death. Herod, the despotic king that, that was over Judea when, when Jesus was born, he wanted to kill the little babies as well. But God rescued Jesus by sending him not out of Egypt, but to Egypt. And then brought him back again. Matthew points this out, that this is out of Egypt I have called my son, is a prophecy from, from Isaiah that is pointing to, to, to Jesus' redemption. We'll see over and over throughout Exodus that these, these foretellings of who Jesus is. He was the Passover lamb. He was the one who gave his life. He was the one who was willing to be broken and, and enter into all of our cries and our groanings, <clears throat> just like God heard the Israelites God hears our groanings as well. As we think about the, these stories that we're going to hear, they are, it, it seems like, you know, it was thousands of years ago, but yet it is very relevant for us today as well. I was talking to someone recently who was struggling with, um, she's in the medical profession, and uh, somebody wanted to put her in a job where she'd have to participate in abortions. 
And she had to say no, even if it meant losing her job, even if, even if that was the risk. She knew that she had to fear God rather than go along with that plan. And God honored her and, and protected her from that. But that was a very real issue right then. Slavery is a very real issue these days, too. There are more slaves in the world today than there were in the 1800s. 50 million slaves, they estimate, whether um, through labor slavery or sex trafficking or uh, lots of other ways. If you want to find out more about that, I would recommend the International Justice Mission, IJM. You can go to their website, IJM.org, and they have some incredible stories uh, about what is going on and how they are helping to redeem slaves even now. As we get ready for this next election cycle, we're going to hit a lot of topics that are relevant to that in this book. And I want to make a deal with you. A lot of words that get used in the world, um, justice and oppression, have baggage to them. But we need to let these words, abortion has baggage to but we need to let these words start from the Bible and not start from politics. We need to let it start from the heart of God and not let the world define them for us. So over the next few months, I want us to, to lean in. What is God trying to say? What is God's heart? God's heart is for oppressed people. He is for this, this whole nation of immigrants who were being oppressed because they feared them. He is for people who save babies. He is for people who, who want to build families and community. He's for redemption, not just spiritual redemption, but also physical redemption. Letting people be freed from that. I think we evangelicals like to kind of concentrate on the spiritual redemption side of things. But God's heart is also for the phys physical redemption. And we have to, to hold all of those things together. This is God's heart. And he wants to take care of those who are lost and, and broken and oppressed, those who are crying out for God. God's word is powerful. And it is what should define us, whatever we face in our world, whether it's in our job, our classroom, our own family. This is the story of God being faithful, of God redeeming broken places. And we know because of the message of Easter that God wins. As much as it seems like the world is winning, that everything is broken and getting more and more broken every single day, God wins. He does have a plan. He does have a way of getting out of this and through this. God is faithful. And we want to be a faithful community of faith to continue to point each other to the grace of God, to the truth of God, so that we can live as people of God, citizens of heaven, we, we, we live here, but we are an embassy. We're an, an outpost of the kingdom of God. We're the ones who get to share the values of the kingdom with those who've never heard of that before. You and I are called to hear the groans of the brokenhearted. We are supposed to set free those who are living in captivity, whether it is to drugs or broken relationships or, or other kinds of oppression. We are supposed to speak life into people whose lives have not been valued, whether that is infants or older people or everybody in between, people with disabilities who are, are, are set aside by, by our society. Jesus cherishes every single one of them. And Jesus is the one who knows that none of us are perfect. None of us know, are able to fix ourselves where none of us are able to be perfect like God is perfect. But he is calling us to be a forgiven people and a transformed people who no longer, when in that list of in Galatians about the fruit of the Spirit, he's saying don't be hateful and, and, and judgmental and all of these stuff. He, he says instead be filled with the Spirit, having the fruit of the Spirit, faith, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That is my prayer for us as we live this transformed life, knowing that we have received grace from Jesus Christ, not because we've earned it, but because he is pouring out his grace on us because he is the ultimate redeemer who has brought us out of, out of our metaphorical Egypt and our real Egypt, brought us out of oppression. He is the one who wants to set us free and send us on a path of reconciliation to bring freedom to everyone else as well. 
when, Jesus, when God brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, he brought them out to worship him. And that is what we want to do, to help people be free from all of the stuff that's holding them down so that they can worship the Lord God with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. God can restore, God can transform, and God can make us and, and the people of God around the world into his community of faith, the body of Christ whose head is, is Jesus himself so that we can glorify God and share his good news to the whole world. Let's pray together. Holy God, we do thank you for who you are. We thank you that you saw the people who were broken and crying out. Lord, and you did not leave them alone in their sorrow, but you brought justice. You brought relief from the, the oppression. You brought value to their lives when no one valued them. You saw the infants who had precious value, and you redeemed them, and, and you didn't only redeem them, you vindicated the deaths of those who'd gone before. Oh, Lord, and you have transformed the, this whole world by sending your son, Jesus Christ, into the, the slavery and oppression that we have had, slavery to sin and brokenness and selfishness and so many other things. You are the Prince of Peace. You have come to bring peace to the world, even when it is filled with wars and rumors of wars. Lord God, we pray that you would transform us, that we would become your redeemed people, that we would see how you are delivering not only ourselves, but those around us. Lord, help us participate in your redemption and bring that good news to the world around us. Let us proclaim the light, the grace, and the hope that is in Jesus Christ, that is in a God who hears, a God who sees, and a God who loves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise with me now as we proclaim our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, was assumed in hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We now come to our time of communion. <clears throat> this is a, a, rem a time to remember, to celebrate, and, and to be marked again by Jesus Christ, who says, you are mine. I have called you by name. You are mine. This is what we, in the Presbyterian world, we call this a sign and a seal. This is the sign that Jesus Christ has died. He, he is risen and he will come again. This is the sign of that. It is also the sign like on our forehead that, that, that we belong to God. It is the seal that, that marks us as, as covered by grace as no longer weighed down by, by guilt and shame, but set free, set free to worship with our whole heart, to boldly approach the throne of grace. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you have chosen to believe in him today, you are welcome to receive these elements, to know that Jesus Christ sees you and loves you and sets you free. Let's come before the Lord to pray together. Lord God, we do thank you and we praise you for who you are. You are the God who created heaven and earth, and yet you are mindful of us. Lord God, we thank you that you have heard in the midst of brokenness, you have sent your son to die for us, to, to conquer sin and conquer death, to rise again on Easter Sunday. And every Sunday we celebrate that same truth that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord, and we worship the lamb who was slain by crying out, worthy is, is the lamb who was slain to receive glory and majesty and power and, and honor forever and ever. 
We proclaim Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit now on these elements, that you would take these common elements and set them aside for sacred purpose, that you would bring us in, through the Spirit into the presence of Jesus Christ, that we may, may sup with him, oh Lord, and that we may, may join with him in, in the relationship that you have offered through Christ, that we are no longer orphans, but we were brought together and called dearly beloved children. And it is as the children of God that we are bold to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.